Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about air. Major topic for the day is going to be smog and acid deposition. So as always, let me get you some objectives. We'll get going. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe the formation of photochemical smog and ozone, and you should be able to explain the effects of acid deposition. Now, we're going to talk about a couple things other than acid deposition and smog formation, but those are our two major topics for the day. So starting out, first thing I want to talk about is sources of air pollution. Now, when we hear air pollution, at least when I hear air pollution, I usually think of the exhaust coming out of a big truck going down the road, or I think of the smoke coming out of a factory. But we have to recognize that the earth does produce natural sources of air pollution. Some of those sources of natural air pollution include forest fires, happen every summer, lightning strikes forests, they catch on fire as they burn, they release carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, tons of particulate matter, so that would be a source of natural air pollution. Lightning is another. Volcanic eruptions obviously release a bunch of uh, natural air pollution. Also, trees and a lot of plants give off those VOCs that we talked about in the last video. So, know that a portion of the world's air pollution does come from natural sources. But, of course, there is also a big portion that comes from anthropogenic sources. Remember, anthropogenic means human created. And top contributors of this type of air pollution include vehicles, electricity generation, road dust. Now, obviously, there are many more than that, from running fireplaces to industrial use and work and things like that, to plowing of fields. There's a lot of ways that humans um, degrade air quality, but have a couple of the major ones in the back pocket to pull from when you need vehicles, electricity generation, and road dust. Now, let's go ahead and jump into our main topic for the day. It's going to be smog and acid deposition. First of all, let's go back and remind you what smog is. Smog is air pollution that uh, is the result of some chemistry that happens in the atmosphere. It usually presents itself as either a brown or gray haze in the air, kind of like you see in the picture there. Across the board, since the 1970s, since the Clean Air Act was implemented, all types of air pollution in America have decreased except for not decreased over time. So have that in the back of your head. And let's take a second and look at how smog forms and also how ozone forms because if you remember ozone in the troposphere that would be ground level ozone is very harmful to the respiratory tract so you need to know how tropospheric ozone and VOCs form and it's kind of a complex process but if you can read this graph it's not so bad. First thing I want to note is you see these big old suns here these reactions only happen in the daylight because they require the power of sunlight in order to cause the chemical reactions to happen. So here's basically how it works. We start out with nitrogen dioxide. It comes from natural or anthropogenic sources. So we start out with this NO2 right here. In the presence of sunlight, this NO2 breaks down to nitrogen oxide, NO, and a free oxygen molecule. Also in the atmosphere, you have got naturally occurring O2. This would be the oxygen that is released from photosynthesis when plants do their thing. This free oxygen that has popped off of the nitrogen dioxide combines with O2, forming O3, which is ozone. And that's the ozone that we've talked about. When this ozone is in the stratosphere, blocks UV light. When it's in the troposphere, it's a severe respiratory irritant and air pollutant. So that ozone forms, and then naturally, and, and again, in the presence of sunlight, this ozone, O3, comes down here. It gives up an oxygen to NO, reforming NO2. And also, since it's given up an oxygen, this O3 becomes O2. And this is kind of a cycle that goes around and around and around and around. So know that this right here is the way that ozone forms. And it's a continual cycle that kind of flops back and forth between the different places. The more nitrogen oxides that we put into the atmosphere, the more ozone is formed. Now, let's take the same reaction. This time we're going to do it in the presence of VOCs, and we'll talk about how that impacts things. So just like before, we start out with our nitrogen dioxide. Sunlight causes that to break down into our nitrogen oxide and a free oxygen atom. That free oxygen atom is then going to go combine with our naturally occurring O2, and it's going to form O3 ozone. Down here, if you'll notice up here, 
we loop things back around. In this case, when we have VOCs present, we can't loop things around because these VOCs, they get in the way of this process. So our nitrogen oxide right here comes down. It combines with the VOCs forming photochemical oxidants. Ozone and photochemical oxidants give us photochemical smog. So this is the process of smog formation. This is the process of ozone formation. Make sure that you go through these diagrams well enough that you understand them and can talk about them if need be. Next topic I want to talk to you about is a thermal inversion. Now a thermal inversion is a situation where air temperature stops pollution from rising up and being carried away. It traps air pollution in a given area. So again, we got some diagrams here I want you to look at. <clears throat> Under normal conditions, if you look right here, temperature, altitude, under normal con conditions, the higher you go up in the atmosphere, the colder the air gets, which is really important because as long as the air is warmer than the air that is around it, it will keep rising up. So under normal conditions, with the atmosphere getting colder as you rise up, this polluted air is warmer than the cool air that's around it, so it can keep rising up. And then eventually it'll get up into the higher atmosphere and be carried away by the wind, so normal conditions. In the conditions of a thermal inversion, you get a situation where you have got cool air down on the bottom, and then you get a layer of relatively warm air over the top. Now, this warm air acts like a lid because remember, air can only rise as high as the air that it is warmer than. So if you got this pollution rising up through the cool air, and then it hits this layer of warm air, it can't rise through that warm air. It's kind of like a lid on the top. So any pollution that's rising up gets trapped, causing really bad air quality issues. And like I said, this is a thermal inversion. Um, it's common in Los Angeles. When I lived in Denver, we used to see this sometimes, but be able to explain this condition right here. And if you're looking at temperature, you've got a situation where the temperature actually rises with altitude. This would be where your inversion layer happens right there, and then it cools down. So this warmer area right here traps all of your pollution underneath. Now we're going to go ahead and move on to acid deposition. Now, simplest definition is acid deposition is Pre, sorry, words are hard right now. Precipitation with a pH below 5.6. So just naturally occurring precipitation is acidic. The um, rain that is in clouds starts out at a neutral 7, but as it combines with naturally occurring and anthropogenic carbon dioxide, it does become acidic. So uh, rain between 7 and 5.6 is normal. Usually you're down towards 5.6, but if the pH of that rain is below 5.6, it's considered to be acidic rain or acid deposition. And the formation of acid deposition or acid rain is something that is important for you to know about, so I'll walk you through it real quick. Acid rain is the result of some primary pollutants combining with some oxidants making secondary pollutants. So our primary pollutants that we worry about with acid deposition are SO2, our nitrogen oxide, so again we're talking about SOx and NOx again, produced from the combustion of fossil fuels, coal, electricity generation, vehicles, things like that. You get your SOx and your NOx produced. <clears throat> These oxygen or oxidants travel through the air and eventually they are going to meet up with clouds. These clouds contain water. So your sulfur dioxide will combine with that water to form sulfuric acid. Your nitrogen oxide will combine with that water to form nitric acid. Those acids further break down and the rain carries these hydrogen ions down to the land. So this rain, because it has a higher proportion of hydrogen ions, is acidic. And these sulfates and nitrates are also carried down to the land. So sulfuric and nitric acid rain down on the land. And that is the formation of acid deposition. When we talk about acid deposition, there's often the idea of it not being my problem because unfortunately, like we talked about in the last video, air pollution is a global problem because you can't combine, confine air pollution to the place that it was created. Usually it gets up into the air currents of the world and is carried to somewhere else. So in a lot of cases, the region that produces the air pollution that is mixing up to form the acid deposition isn't where the acid deposition actually falls. Um, this was a problem well, one example I can give you is in the northeastern United States up near Pittsburgh and a lot of those manufacturing towns. 
those areas were putting out a lot of air pollution as a result of their manufacturing processes, but the acid rain that resulted from that actually fell on Canada. Same thing happened with manufacturing in like the Chicago, Detroit area. As they were building cars, that air pollution was getting into the atmosphere and then falling out over Pennsylvania and New York. So acid rain usually doesn't fall in the place where it's formed. And the effects, just to kind of wrap up, <clears throat> you need to know what acid deposition can do. There's multiple things. First one is decreased lake and stream pH. So this is making natural waterways, surface water um, more acidic, which we've talked about animals having a very specific set of conditions that they are adapted to. So if you take a fish's home or a salamander's home, make it more acidic, it's very possible that those animals will either A, have reproductive issues, or B, not be able to survive at all. Another thing that happens to aquatic ecosystems as they become acidified is that metal is mobilized. So this means that metals that are naturally trapped in rocks, things like aluminum and mercury, as those rocks kind of dissolve as a result of the acidic pH, they release those metals. The metals get into the waterways, and as we've talked about, many metals are neurotoxins and cause health damages. You can have destruction of the food chain. If you have got problems with your waterway becoming acidic, then the base of the food chain or a part of that food chain might die off. If an animal loses its food source, then it's also going to die off. So there can be effects kind of cascading through the food chain. Last effect, or I guess there's two effects I want to talk about. Um, I didn't put damage to plant tissue up there, but that is another one. If plants have got acidic precipitation falling on them over time, it can damage their tissues, re reducing their photosynthetic output or killing the plants altogether. And final thing is acid, P acid pH, acidic rain or acid deposition damages building materials, especially um, things that are built out of limestone. So old monuments, old buildings, if they've got acid rain falling on them over time, that limestone will start to dissolve and it'll get pitted. Right there is a picture of one of these structures in ancient Greece and you can see how over time, it has become eroded and pitted as acid rain has fallen on it. Acid rain could also ruin the finish on cars and the paint on houses and things like that. So I think that's it. Acid rain, smog formation. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. We'll see you again.